Thank you, Dr. Bridges, and, and thank all of you for being here. First of all, Dr. Bridges, uh, as, as you know, is retiring as the Director of Archives and History, and I tell you, Dr. Bridges, you are a treasure for the state of Alabama. We are so fortunate to have you and have had you for a number of years um, running this department, and I know you're not going anywhere. You said you're going to have a cubicle around here. We're going to make sure that that happens, but thank you for your service to the state of Alabama. And thank all of you for being here. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to this and talking a little bit about the book and going back and, and looking at history, um, looking around the audience. Most of you already know the story, um, but uh, hopefully there'll be some things in here that you didn't know. Um, I'm not going to tell everything in the book because I want you to buy the book. Uh, if I do that, then you wouldn't buy it. I, I want to say at the outset that uh, all profits that would be, be due me for the book, I'm donating to a great charity. It's John Curl's Big Oak Ranch, which is a Christian home for boys and girls who need a chance uh, in Alabama. So um, when you purchase a book, know that it's going for a good cause. First of all, the reason I wrote the book, um, I, I was giving a speech to it was Blue Cross and Blue Shields to some of their marketing folks, and I was able to weave in how the campaign 2010 effort paralleled perfectly with marketing a product, any product. And I used the, the, uh, uh, the, the parallels on knowing your product, um, believing in your product, putting a plan together, identifying your customers, and then, of course, selling to your customers. There's no different. And uh, afterwards, someone came up and said, you know, it really did work well. You ought to think about putting it down on paper. And uh, the more I thought about it, I said, you know, it really was an incredible story. And the more you thought back, all the twists and turns and the personalities involved, and we had some peaks and valleys, had some uh, really an incredible team put together. And so I was encouraged to, uh, to write the book. I will tell you, and you probably heard this from anyone, anyone who's written a book, it is hard. It's a lot harder than you think it is. It sounds easy, but it took a lot of time. But now that it's done, I wouldn't take anything for it because it really did allow me the opportunity to go back and working with my friend and colleague, David Asbill, who was there for all of this, uh, to go back and figure out how to put it in uh, some sort of a written form. But um, this is the cover. It's called Storming the State House, the campaign that liberated Alabama for 136 years of Democrat rule. The pictures that you see on the sides are some of our campaign photos that we sent out for the various candidates and some other uh, photos that are dealing with uh, the campaign 2010 effort. So uh, obviously it's a very historic building on the cover and that recognizes the fact that this was an historic story in the history of the state of Alabama. Um, let's first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And let's, let's go to the first picture, David. That is me right there. And, and look at that hair. No, that's not a football helmet. That is my hair that I have on. Uh, I had absolutely no background in politics. Uh, I did, however, have a background in athletics. Uh, back in high school, uh, I loved athletics, but I knew that I was not an athlete. I had started working at the radio station in my hometown when I was 13 years old, and so I wanted to find a way to be a part of the athletic program and also use my, uh, my broadcasting interest. So I was able to do that in high school and became the sports information director for my high school, did the play-by-play, -play, wrote for the newspaper, ended up getting a scholarship to the University of Georgia. And the guy who roomed right next to, door to me in the athletic dorm was a guy named Herschel Walker, number 34. For those of you who don't know, he was a pretty decent running back. Uh, in 1980, as the year I started college, we won the national championship, and Herschel was nothing, nothing less than a phenom. I mean, nobody had ever seen a running back that big and that fast. So I had an opportunity to work on his Heisman Trophy campaign. As I said, I live right next door to him, so my job was to make sure he made his media calls and uh, stayed in contact with him uh, every day, kind of his handler. So I had a great opportunity to do that and while I was in college, and also my college roommate was a guy named Terry Hogue. Uh, Terry was a great defensive back, and uh, kind of as a, uh, a joke, we ran a Heisman Trophy campaign for him. He ended up finishing fifth in 1983, which was the highest finish ever for a defensive back at the time. Still the highest for just a pure defensive back, so we considered that a win. So I had an opportunity to work on a couple of Heisman Trophy campaigns, and uh, when I graduated in December of 1983, um, Auburn University was looking for someone to come and work with a running back they had named Bo Jackson. So two weeks after I graduated, I went to Auburn and uh, worked on Bo Jackson's Heisman campaign. He won it in 1985. And I do have a story in there that's true. When we went to New York for the announcement, it was live. Uh, it wasn't, it's not like it is now, but it was absolutely live. 
Uh, we had to sit through the commercials. It was at the Downtown Athletic Club, had big um, uh, hot lights. It was very uncomfortable. And I had gone to Bo's room before we went down, and he said, okay, what do I need to do? And I went through the procedure, and he said, uh, what do I do if I win? And I said, well, the first thing you do is you stand up, turn around, and shake my hand. And so, uh, <laughs> so if you look at the video, which is actually on the website, uh, when they announced that he won the Heisman Trophy, he turns around and shakes my hand. Now, Bo has a joke and says that I knock people out of the way to shake his hand, but that's, that's not the case. Um, but I worked in athletics and came up. I, I did Coach Dye's television show. I still uh, love broadcasting. And uh, somehow, I don't know how I did it, but I went to Coach Dye and I said, you know, I believe I can do a better job of the television show and radio and the game programs if we put it all together. And so uh, I was 28 years old. In 1990, I uh, started Auburn Network Incorporated and, and put together the radio network. And uh, it was really concentrating on that when in 1995 or 1996, a mutual friend uh, of mine and Bob Riley, uh, Patrick Nix, who had been a quarterback at Auburn, his wife worked for me at the network, said, I've got this guy who's running for Congress and I want you to meet him. And I said, you know, why would I want to meet a guy you know, running for Congress? I have no interest in politics. I didn't even really know there was a congressional race going on. He said, you need to meet this guy. He's from Clay County. I didn't know where Clay County was. So as a favor, I said, okay, I'll meet with him. And I remember telling my wife that morning, I said, I'm having lunch today with this guy who's running for Congress. I don't even know his name. I don't know why I'm meeting with him. But uh, I met with Bob Riley and his daughter, Janice. We ate at the barbecue house in Auburn on College Street. If you're from Auburn, you know about the barbecue house and their peanut butter pie. And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes they're just people that you like. Just immediately, you like them. Well, I liked Bob Riley. I liked him a lot. I liked the way he talked. I liked what he said. He was very open about why he was running for Congress. And I made the decision at that point I was going to get involved in the campaign. I came home and told my wife, I said, I'm going to get involved in this guy's campaign. And she said, why? I said, well, I, I just like him. I think he's the right guy, running for the right reason. So I got involved in his, doing his radio spots and um, uh, did his, uh, worked on his mail and the strategy and got involved in the campaign. Long story short, he won, went to Washington, invited me to come up there for the swearing in. I decided I would go. When else are you going to see a congressman sworn in? And I remember I was walking in front of the Library of Congress, and it just hit me. I said, you know, I really need to get involved in public service at some level. I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's running for the school board or for the city council or, or whatever, but I want to get involved. And um, I started looking around for things to do. And about that time, Pete Turnham, who served in, in the seat that I now hold, announced that he was going to retire after 40 years, longer than I had been alive at the time. And I started thinking, maybe that's what I need to do. And I won't go through all the twists and turns because there's some neat stories in that, but I decided to run. Uh, my wife, Susan, will never forgive Bob Riley for getting me involved in politics. She, to this day, uh, holds him responsible. But I ran for the legislature and was able to win in 1998. And uh, with, I will say, the support and, uh, and advice of then Congressman Bob Riley. I um, immediately learned that it was not very much fun to be in the minority in the Alabama legislature. You know, when I ran, I just really didn't understand how it all worked, but it, it came pretty quick. The first vote that I had to deal with was the lottery. If you remember, that's the year that Don Siegelman defeated uh, uh, the incumbent, Bob James, and his platform was the lottery. And so, you know, that was the big deal. I had campaigned the entire campaign saying I was opposed to the lottery. I would vote against the lottery. And my first experience with the governor was he called me over to his office which is kind of an intimidating office, and uh, he intimidated me uh, and told me how I would be defeated if I didn't vote for this, and you know, it goes on and on, and I, I relay that in the, uh, in the book. Uh, but it really had an effect on me, and then as things uh, went on and on and on, I just saw that we needed to make a change. And so I, along with a number of other um, Republicans, um, were communicating with then Congressman Riley, who had self-term limited himself to three terms in Congress in six years, to run for governor. And uh, proud to say that we were able to convince him to do that. Now, along the way, um, I um, decided that I was going to get involved in the leadership of the caucus and saw how the caucus operated. And you know, we only had, I think, 34 Republicans in the caucus, not a lot out of 105. So we really could not 
pass anything that we wanted. We could, if we stuck together and got a few Democrats to vote with us, stop things. And we got to where we were pretty good at that. But we really couldn't uh, affect much change in, in terms of policy. We didn't control any of the committees. And to me, that just was not a lot of fun. And so uh, I um, decided that I was going to seek the uh, minority leader uh, position. And um, again, against the uh, advice and counsel of my wife, uh, I ran for minority leader and was able to win that. And we had an opportunity to increase our numbers. And really, the, the first opportunity came as a result of a, of a tragic event, the death of Jack Venable, who was an outstanding representative, outstanding human being from Tallahassee. Uh, he was Auburn University Board of Trustee member, and he passed away of cancer. Uh, but it was an open seat, and it was an area where we believed that we could take that seat. It would be a, a first opportunity for us to pick up an open seat and increase our numbers. And we had a candidate uh, who, who ran and won the primary named Barry Mask, who is now uh, state representative. And uh, I, had, I knew Barry. He was the first Aubie uh, at Auburn University, so I knew him from my Auburn ties. And, um, and, and he's also involved in politics. So we, this was the first time that we as a caucus decided to get involved and to help a candidate. And we did get engaged. And we came up with a campaign slogan that we, uh, we really mimicked in 2006 and in 2010, trying to differentiate the difference between Republicans and Democrats. And uh, the way we decided, this is the first one we put together. This is a mail piece that we did for uh, Barry. And one of the reasons that Democrats have been able to stay in control of the legislature for so long is that we as Republicans had allowed them to vote one way in Montgomery and another way, and act another way at home. And we really never pushed the fact that they were Democrats. We couldn't come out and say, you know, these guys are flaming liberals because they weren't, but they were on the Democrat team. So this is a mail piece that we did. And as you can say, we said, around here, folks, judge you by the company you keep. So what does this tell you about Bobby Payne? Well, it told you that he was on the same team as John Kerry, Don Siegelman, Hillary, Bill Clinton, and there he is right there. And it, it turned out to be very successful in our polling. We could tell that uh, people were starting to identify Bobby Payne, the, uh, the Democrat nominee, as a member of the Democrat Party and on the same team as these guys. Um, we did win that election. It was a huge win for us, really not in terms of numbers because it didn't increase our numbers significantly, but from a standpoint of believing that we could win seats and win open seats, it was huge and gave us uh, a tremendous amount of confidence. Um, so we were able to, uh, to handle that. Um, in, uh, let's see, in 2006, uh, well, let me, let me first of all talk about Amendment 1. Um, there is a whole chapter about Amendment 1, so I won't talk about it a lot. That, that brings back some bad memories. I'm the guy who actually carried the Constitutional Amendment and uh, one of the top bills. Uh, but it was after Governor Riley had been elected as governor. I was his floor leader. Obviously, we're in the minority in the House, and, and he inherits a horrible economic situation. And so he proposes Amendment 1. You all know what that was. It was, a, uh, uh, I guess, a, a tax reform measure. And, was um, billed as being a billion dollar tax increase. So um, uh, that failed and then came the 2006 elections and people were afraid that those who supported Amendment 1 were going to go down the tubes, uh, including the governor. And right after Amendment 1, the failure people kind of wrote him off. He's a one-termer, uh, he'll never uh, be able to run again. So during the, uh, the, the uh, uh, ensuing years, obviously Governor Riley worked to rehabilitate himself he did some outstanding things from economic development, and um, he was able to um, actually have a tax cut. So in working on the campaign for 2006, and I actually, uh, the chapter is called Juggling Campaigns and Dodging Bullets because I was working on the governor's campaign, working on campaigns to try to elect uh, legislators, and also running my own campaign. I actually had a primary opponent and a general opponent and they were well funded by the AEA uh, to the tune of a half a million dollars for a house race. So I had uh, my hands full. But I want to show you a, uh, a television commercial that we actually ran um, in 2006. And this was a spot for Governor Riley. And keep in mind that uh, just a few years earlier, he had been portrayed as billion dollar Bob and, pr and proposing the biggest tax increase in the history of the state. And this was a television commercial that we used to transform his image of being a tax raiser to a tax cutter. Three years ago, Alabama faced a crisis of historic proportions. 
but we fought for fiscal discipline. Well, tonight, that record deficit from three years ago stands at an all-time record surplus. And this is no time to turn back. I'm proposing a historic tax reduction package for the people of Alabama to cut their taxes. All right, and the, and the commercial worked. Uh, because in our polling, people viewed him as a tax cutter. Let's show this other one, uh, David. And uh, I think you'll find this one uh, interesting. This was a mail piece. And this talked about all of the positive things going on in Alabama. Uh, when we ran in, 19, er, in 2002, we said, Bob Riley will be a governor that you can be proud of. And this kind of followed that theme of all the positive things uh, that he had done. And during this time, his popularity was uh, at a real height. I want to show you this uh, television commercial that ran in 2006, and I think that you'll find it um, interesting in light of events that happened during his second term. Fact, Bob Riley took at least $75,000 in gambling money from Jack Abramoff and Michael Scanlon, convicted Washington lobbyists. Fact, Bob Riley told us he never did and never would take gambling money because he believes it's immoral. Fact, gambling is big business in Alabama, and Bob Riley has done nothing to stop it. Question, Bob Riley, why'd you take gambling money and lie about it? And if you believe gambling's immoral, why didn't you do something about it? Well, looking back now, I think you can see that Bob Riley did do something to stop it, so maybe he uh, looked back at that television commercial uh, in his second term. In 2006, uh, we had put together a plan as the caucus, and, and I was the minority leader, for the first time, went over to Georgia, met with those guys. They had taken the majority in Georgia. They gave us some great suggestions, including uh, putting together a plan to have dues from members to pay in a certain amount that would be pooled together and work together to try to elect more Republicans to the uh, legislature. And I'll tell you, this was really a change in the way the legislature worked. In the past, there had always been kind of a gentleman's agreement that you didn't go after and challenge incumbents. Um, obviously, the Democrats liked that because they were uh, in the majority. And as minority leader, I, I led the fight to say, we don't need to honor that. We need to tell these guys we're not doing that anymore because we're going to be in the minority for another uh, two or three decades if we do that. We're going to have to stop allowing Democrats to hold seats that are majority Republican. And uh, so we did make that uh, challenge. And obviously, that put a zero on my head, uh, but I felt like I was doing the right thing as being the minority leader, our goal was to try to get to the majority. Let me tell you this, uh, or show you this uh, radio spot, play this radio spot that the Democrats came up with, and it actually comes back in 2010. They came up with something they call their Covenant for Alabama, and they promised that in the 2006 elections, if Alabamians continued to allow them to be the majority party, which they did in the legislature, these were going to be the issues that they would push. This is a radio spot. We are Democrats, the people who build Alabama. Democratic lawmakers have kept Alabama's taxes the lowest in the nation. We've passed record education budgets, putting $800 million more in our children's classrooms. Created thousands of jobs by bringing the auto industry to Alabama. It was Democrats who built the biggest road and bridge construction project in state history. Who brought tax cuts to working families. Established a health care safety net for seniors. Because Democrats believe all life is sacred. That serving the people means standing up for Alabama values. That's why Democrats are offering a new covenant for the future with bold new measures to restore integrity to public service. And crack down on illegal immigration. Our plan brings tax relief and makes Alabama less dependent on foreign oil. Because Democrats believe every Alabama family is worth fighting for. Read the newspaper for more details or visit www.covenantforthefuture.com. Democrats. Democrats. We build Alabama. All right, the uh, Covenant for the Future, that's what they promised. They actually said in the newspaper ad that they would pass 19 different measures within the first 10 legislative days of the first session in the quadrennium. Uh, four years later, of the 19, they had passed three, and most had never been introduced, despite the fact that they continued to hold a majority. They had the chairmanship of every committee and majorities on every committee. That would come back to haunt them in 2010. Now, to combat it, we came back, and we had something called the Republican Handshake with Alabama. And we had measures that we said, if you put us in charge, this is what we will pass. Now, we were in the minority, so we were not able to, to pass it during the uh, next uh, the, the quadrennium after 2006. 
but it did come back and we reinstituted it in 2010 and um, we're actually able to come back and pass it once we took the majority and I'll, I'll cover that in just a little bit. One of the big races that we had, uh, which, which really was crossing the line, as I said, when we decided that we were going to challenge incumbent Democrats, was down in Houston County. Joe Carruthers uh, was a conservative Democrat from Houston County. He had served in the legislature for 27 years. Um, our our um, analysis showed that that was the most Republican district in the state held by a Democrat. And so we decided that we were going to challenge Joe, and uh, it was an interesting um, race, and you can read about it. There's a whole chapter about it, but uh, we got Benjamin Lewis, who was a dairy farmer and an attorney. Uh, he was our candidate. Um, everybody, and I will say everybody in Montgomery was against us in this race. Everybody, except for BCA, Business Council of Alabama, and us were the only ones that were supporting Benjamin Lewis. But we knew that if we ran a campaign that was a coordinated campaign, and this was really a mini campaign 2010. We uh, as, the, uh, as the caucus and running through the party, we did mail, radio, television. We worked with Benjamin. We had somebody that actually lived in a hotel room for three months um, and, uh, and, and held his hand every day to make sure he did the right thing. We were in the polling. We were not doing very well in that race. And we looked at the numbers and actually kind of heard uh, some feedback from a friend, from a friend, from a friend, from the Democrat operatives that our message was not working because people did not believe Joe Carruthers was a liberal. We had been calling him a liberal like Nancy Pelosi and they didn't buy it. But we looked at the numbers and we knew that if we could let people know that he was a Democrat, that we had a chance to win just because of the makeup of the district. So we put together, really at the last minute, a television spot. and. Uh, David Asbell here actually came up with a spot. We were on the telephone or email going back and forth and came up with a baseball analogy. Well, because it was baseball season and World Series coming up or whatever, and, uh, or World Series had just been, I guess. And uh, I'm like, guys, I don't have any baseball footage, but I, I got plenty of old football footage. So we pulled back some 1942 Auburn versus Georgia football video that was in the public domain and made a football analogy. Unfortunately, we have lost that spot, the video part of it, but here's the audio of the spot. And we put this up in a very, very heavy rotation on television in that market. Houston County, it's time to pick your team. Republican Bob Riley and Benjamin Lewis are Democrat Joe Carruthers and Lucy Baxley. Bob Riley and Benjamin Lewis support tax cuts for working Wiregrass families. Joe Carruthers and Lucy Baxley oppose tax cuts. In fact, Joe Carruthers voted for almost $800 million in new taxes on prescription drugs, clothing, and food. The choice is clear. Bob Riley and Benjamin Lewis, the conservative team for Houston County. Now you have to use your imagination. We had all kind of old-timey football figures and punting the ball and had, uh, had Joe Carruthers' head on the guy that kicked Lucy Baxley. I mean, it, 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 was a, it was a pretty interesting spot, but it worked. And we saw the number swing, and at the end of the day, we won that race. We defeated a 27-year incumbent. We also defeated another 27-year incumbent in Skippy White in Escambia County. Um, at the end of the day, it was, a, uh, it was a net gain of zero. We did win a couple uh, and take out incumbents, but we lost a couple. Uh, the Senate actually picked up a couple of seats, so it was actually a positive for the entire legislature. But even though it wasn't a big win, it uh, was a turning point for us because we knew that we could defeat incumbents if we had a coordinated campaign. We also learned a lot from that experience. We didn't have a lot of money, so we did a lot of cookie cutter things. You know, all of our mail pieces looked the same. We just kind of changed the names. We learned that didn't work. But the number one thing that we learned that we did not um, repeat in 2010 was we had to be involved in the recruiting uh, process for candidates on the front end. In 2006, we just waited to see who was going to qualify and who was going to win, to, uh, win the primary, and then we just took what we had. Um, that didn't work. We lost four or five races by 300 votes or less because we didn't have the quality of candidate that we needed. So we did not repeat that mistake in 2010, and one of the big reasons that we won. Now, very quickly, I'll tell you that uh, you know, I said the name of the chapter is juggling uh, campaigns and dodging bullets. They were throwing everything they could at me, uh, saying that I hated school kids, uh, I hated teachers, you know, I, I got an F grade on here. Uh, it was relentless. I, I, I really hated going to the mailbox every day because there was something else about how bad I was. And this is one, it's kind of hard to tell, but they actually put a five o'clock shadow on me uh, to make me look pretty surreal. Uh, 
But there was television, uh, radio. I had to even sell them radio spots on my own radio station attacking me. At least I made a little money off of it, I guess. But I was being attacked as anti-education. Again, AEA put $500,000 in a house race. It's the most expensive house race in the history of the state, which is not something to take a lot of pride in. But it was, it was miserable for me because I was running the, uh, the, the coordinated campaigns, working on the gubernatorial race in my own. And to combat it, this is one of the mail pieces that I sent out. That uh, Yes, I do support education. I have two reasons, Clayton and Riley, and both of them are in public schools. At the end of the day, the, uh, thankfully, the constituents of District 79 did not believe that I hated teachers and hated education and wanted all the kids to be stupid. And, uh, and I was reelected. So uh, it was, it, 2006 was a good year uh, in that case. Um, I'm going to skip now to 2010. All right, we, we have the 2006 uh, quadrennium, and as I mentioned, the Democrats' covenant for the future really turned out to be nothing but hollow campaign promises because they didn't do any of it. They, well, they passed three out of 19. Um, and so we came back with our handshake with the future. And I mean, our handshake with Alabama said, if you put us in charge, here's what we're going to do. So we had a coordinated message with all of our candidates. We got involved in the recruitment process early. Um, we, uh, we actually had someone to go out and uh, be our recruiter. That we, we paid them to do this, to go into the communities where we felt like we could win, look for people. Um, because believe it or not, most normal people don't wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to run for the legislature, which means that I'm not normal. But uh, we actually wanted to find people who had never run for office before, never thought about running for office before, small business owners or professionals, people who understood the private sector is what runs everything. That's who we were looking for. But before we did that, we act, I had to put a team together, and I had to become a party chairman. Um, before the inauguration, uh, Governor Riley's second inauguration, he called me into his office, and I thought he was going to talk about something going on with the inauguration, and he said, Mike, I have something I want you to do for me. And I said, Governor, I'll do anything you want me to do. I mean, for heaven's sakes, my youngest son's name is Riley, so I obviously think a lot of him. He said, I want you to run for party chairman. And I, I know I just got a sick feeling in my stomach, and I said, Governor, I can't think of anything I want to do less than be party chairman. I can't do it. Susan will really divorce me this time. I can be, I can be better for you. I can serve you better by being your floor leader and minority leader, but I can't do both. I'll help you find somebody to run. Well, 10 minutes later, I walked out of his office running for party chairman. Uh, he is very persuasive. Uh, I have a hard time saying no to Governor Riley, but I'm glad he did because it was a great challenge. Um, it, it gave me a platform to further what I had uh, attempted to do in 2006, and that was to make a change in the legislature. As a matter of fact, uh, the day I accepted the, um, uh, the chairmanship in my speech, my acceptance speech, I said, we're going to create Campaign 2010, and it's going to be the most comprehensive, the ag most aggressive, and the most coordinated campaign in the history of Alabama Republican Party, and our goal is to flip the legislature from Democrat to Republican control. And, of course, we got a big applause, but I don't think anybody in that room believed that we could do it because Republicans had been talking about this for years and years and years, and, you know, we, oh, yeah, this is going to be the year we get to 53 and take the majority. And most people didn't think we could do it, but, but I did. I put together, um, I don't think there's any way to describe it other than the best political team in the history of party politics in America. I really did. That's the only thing I take credit for is putting a great team together. John Ross, I knew him from working on the first rally administration, uh, first rally inauguration and campaign. Uh, I got him to be the uh, executive director in, in the book on, on how I knew that he was the right person for this. Um, but the first two people I hired, actually, I had worked with on the Riley campaign and then in the Riley inaugural, and that was uh, Kate McCormick, Kate McCormick Anderson. She's actually here. She's one of the stars of the book. And Sidney Rue, now Sidney Rue Bragle. They were fundraisers. Now, the party had never had full-time fundraisers, and all of a sudden we had two. So that showed that what our emphasis is going to be would be raising the resources to get it done. I hired Philip Bryan, who was also here as our communications director. He had no political experience whatsoever, but he had the right chemistry and uh, affectionately called him the minister of propaganda. His job, his job was to uh, drive the Democrats crazy every day, and he was good at it. Um, but, uh, and then Michael Jofreon, who now works on the Romney campaign, was our political director. And it was just an outstanding team and unbelievable chemistry, and we all had the same goal and we knew what we had to do. But we had to raise the money. The most the party had ever raised for an election year was about $350,000. We set our goal at $4 million. People laughed at us. You're not going to be able to do that. Nobody's going to give money to the party. They're going to give it to candidates. 
But I went out uh, on the road along with Del Marsh, who's now the uh, Senate President Pro Tem. He was my finance chairman of the party. And uh, we went and talked one-on-one -on -one to individuals. Kate and Sidney would set up the meetings. They would have done their due diligence to know that the people we're going to talk to certainly had the ability to donate. They would not know if they had the propensity to do it, but they had the ability. And we went in and we asked them for $10,000 a year for four years, a commitment of $40,000. And of course, when we announced that we were going to create this, we called it the Governor's Circle, um, people said, hey, you're not going to be able to get one person to do it. But we went and we talked to all these individuals one-on-one, -on -one, traveled all over the state, and said, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to take the majority. Here's why we have to take the majority. And one of the lines I used was, you know how great a governor Bob Riley is. You, can you imagine what we could do if every one of his legislative proposals was not dead on arrival as soon as it arrives at the state house? And that's what's happening right now. That's why we have to change it. We cannot... Um, change the state substantively until we can change the legislature. You know, the AEA learned that a long time ago, that, you know, if you control the Alabama legislature, you control the state government because you control the appropriations process, policy making. So um, at the end of the day, uh, we were able to get 104 people to donate $40,000. So at the end, uh, including the dinners that we had and other fundraising uh, efforts that Kate and Sydney put together, we raised, raised about $5.5 million to put in uh, to uh, campaign 2010. Um, we did a lot of polling in, uh, in campaign 2010 after we had uh, recruited the candidates. We lied to them. We told them whatever it took to get them to run. No, we, we really didn't lie to them. We told them the truth. Uh, but we did have a great group of people running. But we were working on our message. And in, in our, one of our polling, uh, in one of our polls that we did, we asked the question, who do you think is in control of the legislature right now? Well, surprisingly, a majority of Alabamians thought that Republicans were already in charge of the legislature. Well, that's a problem. But then we asked the question, if you knew that Democrats have been in control of the Alabama legislature for 136 years, would you be more or less likely to vote to give the Republicans a chance? It was like 83% of the people said, oh, we'll let Republicans uh, have a chance. So we were all brainstorming one day. We said, how can we get this message across? And finally, uh, it was Minda Riley Campbell, uh, Governor Riley's daughter, who was working with us uh, at the party uh, and, and was a, a key uh, part of our team. I should have mentioned her earlier. Uh, she said, why don't we just say 136 years is long enough? And so we actually came up with yard signs. We had billboards that we put in strategic locations. We had bumper stickers. We put on a website, 136years.com. Everything was 136 years. And it got people to say, in 136 years, what's 136 years? And um, we came back and said, well, um, that's how long the Democrats have been in control of the Alabama legislature. And it worked. And we were able to, uh, to flip uh, a lot of folks on that uh, and convince them to give us a chance. Here's a video that we put together at the party. We did this totally in-house. We put it on the web. We emailed it out. Uh, and this was another way to reinforce the fact that we had been in the minority for a long time. The year was 1874. Hawaii still had a king. Jesse James and his gang of thieves were robbing trains. Grant was president. And Levi's were $13 a dozen. Yes, 136 years ago, things were a little different than they are now. But one thing has remained the same since 1874. Democrat control of the Alabama legislature. After 136 years of control, Democrats care more about the liberal special interest groups than the people's interest. After 136 years of power, Democrats refuse to pass legislation to curb corruption. After 136 years, Democrats felt they owned Alabama, so they voted themselves a 62% pay raise with our money. After 136 years, the Democrats have brought us Obama, Pelosi, government health care, liberal policies, higher taxes, and wasteful spending. But after 136 years, it's time for a revolution in Alabama. On November 2nd, 2010, let's send Obama, Pelosi, and the corrupt Democrats a message. A message that says 136 years is long enough. All right, Philip Bryan wrote that, and we put it together, and I tell you, it went viral on the Internet, and we played it at... Republican Party meetings around the state, and it really did get people fired up. Interestingly, this was the Democrats' response. Hello, this is Hank Sanders, Alabama State Senator, and I'm still mad at them. I say, hell no, I ain't going back to the cotton fields and Jim Crow days. I'm going forward with Ron Fox, Jim Bolton, and others who will do right by all of us. I hope you are mad at hell and will not go back. You have the power to choose. Governor Jim Bolton, for Lieutenant Governor on November 
All right, uh, hours work better. Here is one of our candidates, one of the great candidates that we recruited, is a guy named Barry Moore down in Enterprise, going against a, uh, an incumbent, Terry Spicer. You, you probably recognize that name. Uh, but just this, I thought this was interesting because of technology. Barry spoke at a rally, and somebody taped it with uh, an iPhone or a, a video phone. And the quality was not really broadcast quality, but we loved what he said. And so we actually came up, someone in the office, I don't know if it was Philip or Kate or Sydney, Kate and Sydney kind of moved over into production along with Minda during the campaign. We said, why don't we put these on television screen so it looks like it's coming across TV? And I think it worked. This is a spot for Barry Moore. How in the world did we get to this point in our nation? How in the world is it that we have Barack Obama as president? If I know what happened, we were at home raising our families. We were at soccer fields. We were at church or around a dinner table or working on homework and we were tired because we had been working all day. And the liberals were at City Hall. And they were marching up and down these city streets. And they were at these courthouses. Times have changed. We don't get government out of the way. Unemployment going to continue to climb. And I'm telling you that Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid do not have the answer to fix this economy. And I don't know if they want to fix it. This kind of thing here sends a message to the elected people in office. This is the kind of message we need to be sending. We want our freedom back. We want our country back. Just get the government out of the way and let small business do what they need to do to fix the problems with this country. And the patriots of this nation have always rose to the occasion. They will not fail us now. Thank you. That spot was uh, extremely successful, and you see what we were able to do with, a, with an iPhone video. So it actually worked out pretty well. Next one was a, uh, a race we had in Coleman County. We had an incumbent, James Fields, who had won a, uh, a special election. And in the book, this was one of the valleys for us. Losing that special election in Coleman County to James Fields uh, was a low point. But we came back in the general election, uh, in the regular election of 2010, and uh, we're able to put together a, a campaign against James Fields with a, a great candidate, Mac Buttram. Here's one of the uh, negative spots that we ran, or I guess we call it comparative spots, not negative, on, on James Fields. In 1992, our son Randy was murdered. The man who killed our son was given life without parole. <laughs> Representative James Fields has tried to pass the law to let murderers out before serving their time. He's tried to pass this law twice and he's only been in the office for three years. These aren't the values we need in Montgomery, not for my family, not for your family. And not for our son, Randy. We, uh, we did win that race, and, and I will say on the television spots, I mean, everything we did was coordinated as far as polling, opposition research, radio, television, mail, uh, our message was coordinated, and on the television spots, we actually, uh, Minda, uh, produced the spots for us, and we were able to produce each spot for around $1,000, whereas most TV spots are around 10000 We wanted to put money into running the spots instead of production. One of the big races we had that nobody thought we'd be able to win was House District 14 in Walker County. Uh, House District 14 was held by uh, Ken Guin, who was actually the majority leader and the rules chairman for, uh, for the Democrats. And uh, we looked at the numbers and felt like that we would be able to, to win that race. We recruited a guy to run. He was a UPS driver. And, um, and one of the things that Mr. Guin kind of made fun of him, you know, being opposed by a UPS driver, but the UPS driver knew everybody and uh, was a great candidate. One of the things there at the end when the polling showed that we had a chance to win this, uh, Ken got um, our candidate, Richard Bond's ex-wife, uh, to cut a spot, um, which um, ran, and we, we got advance notice about that. I'll talk about that in a second. So we knew the spot was coming. We hadn't seen it, but we knew what it was about, and we started on a response to it even before they started airing. But this is the spot that aired against our candidate. Richard Bond is not the man he pretends to be. The night that I told my husband Richard I had been diagnosed with lupus, he gave me a set of car keys and he showed me the door. Richard told me that you wouldn't believe the power and perks he would have if elected to this job. He's in it for the power, the money, and the control. All right, that spot ran. We, we got a little advance notice. We knew that that was coming. I can't tell you how we knew it because I'd have to kill you all. But we, we knew it was coming. About 11 o'clock at night, uh, we were having emails going back and forth with John Ross and myself and Dax Swadek, who was one of our consultants, and David. And 
it's probably the fastest in, in Minda, uh, one of the fastest spots we've ever put together. And um, we, we rode it um, probably within 15 minutes. And we had it arranged for a film crew to meet us in Birmingham and for Richard and his kids to come to Birmingham. We shot the spot. Uh, Minda drove down here to Montgomery, had the spot produced at G2 Productions. We had it on the air the next day in heavy rotation. This was the response that we had to the spot you just saw. Growing up, our dad, Richard Bond, taught us the important lessons in life. Christian values and to lead by example. To have strength and courage when you face adversity. Like all families, we've had our share of good times and tough times. But our dad taught us that honesty and integrity are true tests of a person's character. As we've watched Dad campaign, we've seen him practice what he's preached to us for so many years. Dad, we're proud of you. Richard Bond, a new direction for Alabama. So we didn't talk about the allegations at all, but it was a pretty powerful response. Um, we won that race. On election night, we had a lot of races come in, some that uh, we, we felt like we were going to win, some we were hopeful, and it really came in better than we ever thought. Uh, this is a tally sheet that one of my colleagues, Jim McClendon, who was there at the headquarters, this is in the book too, he was keeping up with all the calls, and this was the tally sheet, and he gave me a copy of this, and I actually have it framed and in my office in the State House. Uh, oh, what a night, election night. Uh, November 2nd, 2010, and it was a great night. Let me show you this photo here. This is the, the dream team. The next spot. That's the dream team right there. This was right after we knew that we had taken. This is Ryan Cantrell, one of our, he's our deputy political director, Michael Joffrion, a political director. That's Kate. Uh, that's me standing next to her. Bending down is uh, Blakely Logan. She helped us on uh, some of our new media along with Meg Eldridge. Um, whose uncle is, uh, is Dan Coates, who's the uh, U.S. Senator from Indiana. Um, you see me up there, and next to me, that's Minda Riley Campbell, and Sidney Rue, the fundraiser slash production person. That's John Ross, uh, who is executive director, and Philip Bryan, the minister of propaganda. And that was a great team, and I'll always cherish that shot. That, that really is the best political party team I believe has ever been put together. Um, very quickly, uh, I'll tell you what. Philip, I may, I mean, uh, uh, David, I may skip this next video. Um, long story short, we came into session. We had a special session. We passed ethics legislation, seven bills in seven days. Took us from having, having some of the weakest ethics laws in the country to some of the best. It was a huge victory, and it was great because Governor Riley was still the governor at that point and was able to sign those bills into law. So at least for one special session, Governor Riley was able to have a friendly legislature uh, to work with. Um, at the end of the regular session uh, that we had in uh, 2011, we passed every one of our handshake with Alabama promises that we said we were going to pass. Even though we didn't promise to do it, we did it within the first 10 days of the, uh, of the legislative session. So we actually uh, followed through on what we promised. I'll tell you, skip the, the video and go to the next one, uh, David, if you can. All right. Uh, again, this is the charity that the money uh, profits for me uh, would go to. It's a Big Oak Ranch, which is a Christian home for boys and girls. There are some phenomenal stories of work they do, uh, totally unselfish. And we have a website I'd love for you to go to. We have a lot of this multimedia, and we have other uh, commercials. We have uh, mail pieces, radio spots that go along um, with stories in the book. And so as you go along, you can uh, follow it on the website and get more information. It's stormingthestatehouse.com. So that is the presentation. I appreciate it. We'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand and we will get the microphone to you and please speak directly into the microphone. No questions. Another well, David, story. David, can we go back and uh, can you go back and show the video? This is a video that we put together uh, our House Caucus after the first regular session to show what we've done. And most of the folks on here are new guys, freshmen that we recruited and were successful in winning. In terms of the substantial nature of bills that we passed, uh, the work ethic that we have brought to the state house, uh, there's no doubt it's been more of a business-like approach. And uh, I think that's what the people expected when they put us in charge of the legislature for the first time in 136 years. They didn't want the status quo. And we've certainly shaken things up. On November 2nd, the voters of the state of Alabama well, voted to have someone.
something different in Montgomery. Well, after I heard 36 I promise it looks better than that. Yeah. Well, anyway, we, I'm sorry about that. We, we did a video basically bragging on the fact that we had followed through on everything that we had promised the people of Alabama that we would do if uh, they put us in charge. So the, uh, the book uh, tells the complete story of that. It is an historic story in terms of politics in Alabama, and I hope that you will buy a copy and hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hey, Alvin. Are you confident about keeping your majority in the election coming up? You know, I am. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely confident that the people of Alabama support what we are doing as the majority party in the legislature. Um, and I can promise you we're not going to stick our hands, heads in the sand. I mean, we, it took us long enough to get here. We're going to, uh, to fight to keep it. Uh, I predict that the fights uh, from here on out are not going to be in the general election, but will be in the primary. And the big concern that I have is that we will have people who will try to hijack uh, our primaries and run. Uh, they would have normally been Democrats running in the general election, but since they were not able to win, they will run as Republicans in our primary, and we have to be in a position to guard against that. And that kind of changes the rules of engagement. Uh, the Republican Party will not be able to be the vehicle uh, that runs the campaigns at that point because if you get the party involved in a primary race, uh, you know, then things start to fall apart. So uh, it's going to be incumbent upon us uh, to make sure that we're uh, keeping an eye on that, pro on that process. All right. If there are no other questions, uh, Speaker Hubbard will be here after the program. You may want to talk to him uh, personally. And he wants to autograph your book. Books are available for sale on New South Books in the hallway. Thank you so much for coming today, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.